benvenuti a tutte e a tutti al 171 mercoledì eh, di Nexa che questa sera si terrà in lingua inglese ehm, per questo motivo eh, inizio subito a parlare in, in inglese per dare il benvenuto al nostro ospite. So welcome uh, to everybody um, to the 171st uh, Nexa Wednesday. Uh, this evening we have uh, a guest uh, from, uh, uh, from Canada, Professor Christoph Becker. Welcome, Christoph. And uh, uh, Christoph Becker is Professor of Information at the University of Toronto, where he leads uh, the, both the Just Sustainability Design Lab and uh, uh, the Digital Curation Institute. Uh, he is one of the co-founders of the Casrona Manifest for Sustainability Design, a well-known initiative uh, in the field of, uh, uh, of software uh, engineering. Um, Professor Becker is author of the book that we will uh, discuss this evening, uh, Insolvent, How to Reorient Computing for Just Sustainability. So many thanks, uh, um, Christoph, for being here uh, with us uh, tonight. Before uh, leaving the stage to you, I will, um, um, I will make a, a very short round of um, presentation of, of the people who is physically here at the Nexa Center so that you can have a rough idea who, who is listening uh, to you uh, here in Torino. And then uh, there, there is also Uh, some, uh, some other people connected uh, uh, remotely. Um, so we start from myself. Uh, we know each other. I'm Antonio Vetro. I'm an associate professor here at the Politecnico of Torino and software engineer. And on my left, I'm um, okay, Carlos Stevanati, professor of engineering at the Politecnico and co director of the Nexa Center for Intelligence Society. Okay. Uh, I'm Maurizio Borghi, I'm a professor of law uh, at the University of Turin and I am the co-director of the Nexa Center. I'm Valeria Bergantino and I'm in charge of the communication at the Nexa Center. I am Ludovica Fazeri and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Turin in philosophy of law and legal informatics. I'm Giuseppe Rocca and I've been following those seminars because I really like them. <laughs> I'm Giacomo Conti, a project manager here at Nexus Center. I'm Marco Ricolfi, a retired professor at the law school and co-director of the center. I'm Brian Cannon, I'm a researcher at the University of Turin Faculty of Law. Thank you. I'm Vincenzo Viscuso, a freelancer, uh, internet uh, developer from Milan. Welcome. And I'm Marco Rondi, and I'm a Is this student here at the Center? Okay, so, uh, Christoph. Grazie mille, buonasera. Um, thank you very much. Very happy um, to see you all. Um, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Um, hopefully, not too bad. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for your invitation and for your kind introduction. And thanks to everyone who is joining us. <clears throat> and um, I also would encourage anyone who is in the chat, um, who is online, to write into the chat who and where you are, if you like, in whatever way you're comfortable with. Um, Yes, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that colonialism is not in the past. It is very much present and it continues to shape our lives. And the land on which the University of Toronto operates and on which I work and I live is the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And they've lived with these lands for thousands of years. And today this land is still their home. And um, acknowledging the land is an indigenous protocol that allows us the opportunity to appreciate this unique role and relationship that each of us has with the land. And it's also a gentle reminder of the broader perspectives that of expand our understanding to encompass the long-standing rich history of the land and our privileged roles in residing here. Um, and um, I would say that we're not currently doing a very good job of relating to that land. 
So um, for me, coming to realize that in uh, I'm a settler in North America was uh, quite uncomfortable. And it, it came about also by encounters with others who helped me see beyond my own horizon and, and helped me understand better how the past shapes us and how it continues. And in, in Solvent, I talk about a concept I call the critical friends of computing, fields like feminist science and technology studies and others that offer a productive, constructive relationship with computing, which needs their insights. Because critical friends tell us the things that others cannot say or will not say, or that who we wouldn't listen to, but we listen to our critical friends because we respect them and we trust that they mean well. And so they might make us aware of a metaphor we use that is rooted in ableism or racism, or they might make us realize that our way of thinking is limiting the meaning our work can have, um, or they might get us to read something that is really uncomfortable, but it, it helps us learn because they might understand that we need to grapple with it. But it takes two for a friendship and critical friendships are no exception. We need to listen to, and that can be uncomfortable, um, but it's it's worth remembering that critical friends critique because they care, and, and I think I do too. And um, we need friends, especially in times of crisis and in, in times of crisis of meanings, what, what these friends might tell us might be hard to hear sometimes. Um, it might not just be things we don't know, but um, things that we think we know that get rattled. Um, so there's really no doubt that we are in such times. Uh, and like most other people, tech workers um, know that the climate crisis is here. A report last year um, suggested that 92% of uh, software practitioners who are already concerned about climate change. I imagine that number has only gone up. Um, and um, it's, it's always um, difficult to choose which news items to pick to, to place something in a, in a current time. Uh, we're now in the 10th month in a row that heat records are shattered and 2024 is not going to get any better. On the other hand, um, and I was happy to see that there are some uh, law scholars in the audience as well. It was very interesting to see very, very uh, recently this week that uh, the European um, Court of Human Rights ruled against uh, Switzerland in favor of a group of women who started a lawsuit nine years ago around climate inaction. So there's definitely interesting times. And so the, the, the uh, the news around data centers in their energy consumptions are one of these items that have brought the environmental consequences of IT to a lot of people's attention. Uh, it's not just the energy use and the e-waste that is happening. It's also the, the water use of large data centers and many other issues that uh, some communities are organizing to push back against, as in this headline there. The, the whole hype of so-called AI has definitely been very good for the shareholders of tech companies like NVIDIA, for example, who's producing a lot of the chips. Data centers um, are often in, uh, placed in areas that already don't have much water. And so in, in, those, in that vein, it doesn't sound like good news to me that Microsoft is planning to put $100 billion into more of the same. That is not a typo. And of course, meanwhile, the owners of fossil fuel companies and mining companies are, are delighted. It's going to be a boon for them. And so, in turn, climate change is only one of the six planetary boundaries that we have already breached, and we're in completely uncharted territory for human civilization. There's hardly a way to exaggerate the, stage, uh, the stakes, and I don't even want to dwell on it very much because I assume um, this, is, uh, this is quite commonly um, understood. The planet is burning and we need to make changes. And the question for many of us at the intersection of computing and society is what is the role of computing in all of this? And so just for the record, as you may know, I've completed four degrees in computer science and I joke that I'm still recovering from that, but I also still love computing. But if we do want to understand how tech can help with sustainability, we can't start with the tech. We need to understand sustainability first, um, the capacity to endure, most importantly, probably the capacity of our planet's ecosystems to endure. And um, that is complicated. It's complex. And we can say that it's complex in a few ways. One is that the subject is complex because we have to consider environmental aspects such as the safe planetary space uh, shown on the right, together with social factors, economic questions, technical decisions, and other aspects of technology design, where these aspects are always intertwined. 
Second, the social situation is also complex because we're dealing with longer term global issues. We need collective action, but our individual influence is fragmented. And some of us have much more influence than others. And third, it is also ethically complex. And I just want to highlight two facets of that ethical complex complexity. One is that people with different perspectives in that space may not only disagree about facts and values, but about how they interpret the world to begin with and what kinds of facts and values matter to the situation and where to draw the boundaries of their discussions. And sometimes there is no common ground between their positions because these positions are incommensurable. And two, there is an asymmetry of how some people and other living beings are much more vulnerable than others. So the past influences us and it influences future generations, but obviously we cannot influence the past. And those who live in a future of collapse cannot reach back into the past to hold us responsible. And so the result of that is a moral hazard. And so this, ta this talk is, is very openly about reorienting tech, which does of course imply that we're not headed in the right direction. And the impact of environmental destruction, um, whether it comes from data centers or other, other things, it always disproportionately affects those who are already vulnerable and non-human nature much more than those who are most responsible. No billionaire becomes houseless because of a forest fire. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, Mark Zuckerberg is now spending a quarter billion euros, again, billion, not a typo, to have a bunker built in Hawaii. So just sustainability as a concept comes out of environmental justice research and it encapsulates this understanding that environmental sustainability is never just about the environment. It's always a question of equity and a question of justice as well. As Argyman and others write, a poor environment is not only a symptom of existing injustice, rather a functioning environment provides the necessary conditions to achieve social justice as well. And so the framing of just sustainability is, reminds us that the two are always entangled mm -hmm. and um, that we need to, to keep that in, in, into account. So environmental sustainability and justice um, are always linked, cannot be treated as separate, and in the term just sustainability is the two meet. Um, in a way, um, justice is a key to solve the climate crisis, could be um, one way to put that. And computing has a conflicted relationship to both. Many of us hope for a technology-supported transition to more sustainable and just societies. But maybe the question is, what kind of technology does that? And so in principle, computing can be a key to just sustainability. It can enable open information access. It brings us together in sessions like this. It can support conscious lifestyle choices. Uh, it can support accountable democracies. And to some degree, to some limited degree, it can support the partial decoupling of value creation from material resource consumption in certain circumstances. Uh, it has brought us Wikipedia and OpenStreetMaps and, and many other examples of digital commons. And its nature as a general purpose technology turns into a potential enabler of many other technologies. So that's great, but in practice, the opposite is much more common. Everywhere on this planet, Tech drives environmental damage, increases the demand for resource extraction, re reinforces inequality and injustice, and erodes privacy and democratic governance. So both the hopeful and the disastrous roles of IT are true at the same time. And many in tech now work on designing for sustainability and social justice, and they want to tackle questions of, for example, justice and fairness in computing. But their good intentions, it seems, have not really changed the trajectory of IT. It's more that we hear about the harmful effects of IT every day. And so I call these harmful effects the depths of computing. The direct and indirect, often invisible harms the technology causes, especially at a distance. And so personally, for various reasons, I'm less focused on e-waste and energy use. I'm more focused and interested in how IT reconfigures our social and political relationships and how it reinforces and amplifies or fights inequality, racism, ableism, colonialism, and so on. And so, of course, both of these um, uh, relationships are important. And unfortunately, the harmful effects rarely afflict the designers. More typically, the harmful effects are offshored and, and affect those that are far away. And so there's, these depths are mounting, but computing has gotten away with externalizing them so that others pay for them, essentially. And so, um, if we still love technology, um, as I do, I guess, then we need to say with all the love, so to say that right now computing is a bit stuck and we need to change its direction. 
And so when we return to that nature of complexity, subject, social, and ethical, uh, we can probably agree that computing is actually very well suited to help with, with handling domain complexity. It's really good at that. But I want to talk a bit about how well it, equipped it is to handle the social and ethical complexity of just sustainability. Um, and that's where the critical friends will, will have some things to say. And so just sustainability brings the far away into focus. We design and build technology for the future and the effects of design choices are always dispersed in time and place, more so now than before. An Italian person's decision to invest in Bitcoin affects e-waste recyclers in Bangladesh months later, for example. One study actually calculated that each dollar of Bitcoin causes about a dollar of health damages just in the US and China alone. And that is only if that is merely the parts of health that you can quantify in dollars very easily. Um, or if you if you look at more more common popular software systems, um, the decision of a traveler to use Airbnb and the decision of travelers to do that at scale has enabled behavioral shifts in investors. These two shifts have reinforced each other and significantly worsened the urban housing crisis in places like Toronto and New York and in many other cities, including many European tourist hotspots. But so the thing is that the social and temporal distance between design choices and their, their far reaching effects very mm -hmm. often hides these harms. The effects are dispersed, so they seem uncertain. They have probabilities, but they are also ambiguous, which is not just that there, there's uncertainty about uncertainty, but it implies that the meaning of what we look cure is not fixed and the meaning needs to be interpreted. And finally, it comes with this asymmetric power. Those who are alive today, um, especially those with more power, have that power asymmetrically over the poor, over non-human nature and over the future. And so those who are affected by technology development often have little means of influencing the design decisions. And in the case of future generations, they have almost no way at all to hold us accountable. So the situation entails what is called asymmetric vulnerability. And one might say that these distant stakeholders carry the depths of computing. And so because of this asymmetric asym vulnerability, the deepest challenge of just sustainability is not really a technical or a scientific or an economic challenge, but an ethical challenge. What matters most is what we do to protect those vulnerable to our actions and unable to hold us accountable, especially the global poor future generations and non-human nature is how Gardiner puts it. And because harms are dispersed temporally and spatially, and because the vulnerability to these harms is asymmetric, it's very easy for those who design tech and who own tech to disregard the debts that their choices incur. But economically, that's because the debts are paid by others. Cognitively, they always seem far away. And ethically, those who design are typically privileged and biased in their own favor. As Gardiner writes that our position is not that of neutral observers, but judges in our own case with no one to properly hold us accountable. And so that creates a moral hazard that we have to account for. And so that is one reason why just sustainability challenges how we think about technology. Uh, designing for just sustainability asks us to reflect on how we think about technology and its role in our societies. And it puts really center stage the importance of a systemic understanding that always views technical systems in the social, ecologically, cultural context and history. And so it is of course widely acknowledged that there's always a mutual relationship between technologies and social life. We, we know that all scientific and technological artifacts are social constructions that we have made. Mm -hmm. And we know that essentially all the social relationships that make up what we call society are configured by technology, are affected by technology. Right now, for example, the technology of this webinar configures in very particular ways who can see what, who is heard, who can contact whom, and of course, that's the product of historical development of broadcasting and online video and many design and development choices made in production and installation and use, including the choice of um, an open source uh, video platform, which is great. Um, if we design uh, for just sustainability, then we need to understand both at the same time, how technology are social and how modern societies are technological. So we have to combine the conversation about how computing shapes our life with a close and critical look at how it comes to life. 
And so the question then maybe is, is, is the tech world ready for that? Is the is computing ready for that? And I, unfortunately, as is maybe it's already obvious, I believe that in its current dominant form, it is not. And I think I've learned this in, in three different ways that combine together. Personally, my own education in computer science and my industry experience, it didn't just not prepare me to to see that. It made it more difficult for me to see what was really going on. It kind of narrowed my view with, by giving me a set of beliefs and metaphors to organize my thinking that really distorted what I could talk about. It gave me the false sense uh, that when you work on su sustainability, that means basically that you solve difficult problems of sustainability with a rational science-based approach to designing and engineering technology, and that that is all there is. So one problem at a time, we get closer to a sustainable world. That's the story. And it took me quite a long time to climb outside that box that my education put me in, so I could see that that was a very limited view, and it took a, lo a lot of reading. Um, and then the third thing is that I've seen time and again that very smart people around me with the very best intentions um, still struggle like me to find the perspective and direction for their work that is really genuinely conducive to um, progressing towards just sustainability. And so at the heart of Insolvent is that story of um, how that is shaped by the nature of computing, um, how why computing is stuck in a sense, um, and um, and how the critical friends can help us get out of that box. And so to, to put it very bluntly, and of course that is a simplification, computer science does understand itself as the foundational discipline of computing that studies the use of computers to systematically solve problems. That's a central mission statement um, restated recently by a task force of CS education. Of course, not all, but many computer scientists see the essence of computer science in what's called computational thinking a powerful toolbox of algorithmic mechanisms that we can use to solve problems. Now, computational thinking is amazing. It's very powerful. Um, I got into the field because of it. But the thing is that computational thinking does not give us any support in handling the social and ethical complexity of designing for just sustainability. On the contrary, it does something quite insidious. It makes it appear as if all the complexity was the main complexity as if all of it was a technical question. And, and the, the reason why is something we have to get further into. And as a recent study attests, as a result, the field of computer science has not really come to this full realization that it now deals with problems that exceed its traditional field of competency. And so what I see time and again is something quite dangerous that computer scientists and designers and startup companies, they do work on on questions of sustainability and justice, but they treat them as if they were merely technical problems. And the effects are often quite devastating, but rarely to those who cause them. And maybe that is changing. Maybe that has been changing, um, but to what degree is, is a bit questionable. Um, so I felt quite stuck for a few years, but at some point after quite a lot of reading and, and collaborations um, with areas like sustainability sciences, critical social theory, the history and philosophy of technology and some psychology, I, I began to form some understanding of why computing is so stuck. And I'm focused here in this talk more on the way of thinking, not on the structural conditions of capitalism. Those are at least as important, but I find that we can't really talk about them while we're boxed in. That has to come afterwards. And so when we focus on the ways of thinking, then to put it simply, computing is stuck in ill-conceived assumptions about the nature of problems, the workings of the human mind, the history and politics of technology, and what it means to design. And so to be clear, this is not just true for computing, it's also true for other tech spaces. And at the same time, it's of course not equally true for everyone and for every field and corner in tech. There's a lot of variety. It is just largely true for what we might call the mainstream, the modern, um, dominant, um, orthodox view of, of computing. And so the torque of these false beliefs vary, but their influence is quite far reaching and it always happens beneath the surface. And that's, that's what makes it difficult to, to, to talk about it. And so these myths, these beliefs, instead shape how we talk about issues and what we can actually talk about. 
And so in, in Solvent, I spent quite a bit of space introducing these myths of computing. And very briefly, myths are, in a sense, they're widespread, but flawed, false beliefs. But they're more than that. They're also important foundational stories that give cultural meaning to our world. And they shape how we can talk about it. They're building blocks of ideology. And in tech, we talk about the world very largely based on this myth mythology or ideology that gives us the illusion of a neutral technical rationality. So probably the simplest of these myths is this idea that technology is value neutral. That story says that because facts are distinct from values, so science and technology are only about facts. And when we produce facts and when we produce artifacts and technology, we shouldn't try to put our values into them. In fact, we can't actually do that because technology doesn't have values. They're just human. And so values don't have a place in it. It's a, it's a very common story, maybe much less common um, for many of you in comparison to the, the more orthodox mainstream, considering that you're attending talks like this. Um, but it is very common. And, but, and so it's maybe clear that it's false, but here's just one simple illustration of just how false that is and what it hides. Software systems and algorithms are never neutral. Quite on the contrary, designers and organizations who produce them embody their values. Their design choices embody specific values in the systems and they produce and shape features and qualities they construct. And so software systems in turn express and enact these values through their behaviors and affordances. As Grady Butch put it very well, every line of code represents moral decisions. Every bit of data that is collected and analyzed and visualized has moral implications. And some of these implications are immediately obvious, others not so, not so much. Uh, when we select a Boolean as a type for the gender variable, for example, as in this example, that's a choice and it is not a neutral choice. It embeds the conservative value of binary gender stereotypes into a material artifact of code. And then it will lead to situations in which a person that does not conform to the stereotype will experience a torque. For example, airport body scanners tend to flag trans people as suspicious. Uh, Costanzo Choc explained this really well in Design Justice. But the opposite, if we say we don't choose a Boolean, we choose a more appropriate type for the variable, or maybe we refrain from collecting data about gender. That is not a neutral choice either. That explicitly considers the value of gender sensitive technology design, and it enacts that value in code instead. So there is no neutral ground. Every choice we make turns some values into some facts. And the myth of neutral technology hides that. It diminishes the role that values play in determining the shape of technological artifacts so that it can maintain the illusion of, of, of neutrality. Um, Feinberg puts it um, that values are not the opposite of facts. Values are the facts of the future. So technology shapes reality through its functions and its affordances and effects and the constraints it imposes. So the values in technology have a lot of reach. Uh, and so because they are expressed in technological artifacts that result from choices made by designers and developers, technology designers cannot evade a moral responsibility for those values. There's no such thing as a value-free technology. Um, so the guiding question is maybe how do values become facts? And in design, which values do we want to become facts? Whose values get to prevail? And there is a range of methods and techniques we can use to support value-sensitive technology work, value-sensitive design, value-sensitive engineering, and the more critical reflections that come with that. Um, so there's a lot more to say about each of these myths. Um, I'll just give you an idea, and then I'll, I'll focus on one of them. Uh, the, the myth of rational decision-making distorts how we think about those judgments in technology design that, for example, turn values into facts, to put it simply. And so in this story, in this myth, human thinking is information processing, and the human mind is basically a computer that doesn't work quite correctly. Human deviations from rational choice are biases and limitations and errors. The myth of objective problems maintains that problems are real things out there that we can discover and then correctly specify using scientific methods. And the central question in problem statement is on correctness or maybe on consensus. And together, this 
ideology, this set of myths, tells a very optimistic story of technology as a savior solving problems, improving our world. And in that story, problem solving is really the central activity of technology design. And that has been said very explicitly. Um, and so to design is to solve problems using value neutral technology through a series of decisions that should be rational. And so um, it, it is almost a trope, but especially in the case of these myths, it really is very true that um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced because these myths are not at the surface. We don't believe in these narratives typically the way we believe the weather forecast or the law of gravity or the latest study about climate change. These stories, they sit under the surface of our thoughts and our discussions, and then they shape and distort what we can talk about when we talk about an issue such as sustainability or climate justice. And so looking in depth at how exactly these narratives shape the discourse can help us or contribute to what Paulo Freire called conscientiousness, um, learning to perceive social, political, economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality. So to kind of wake up from that. And so in practice, the myths interact and mutually reinforce in each other. And when we let problem solving become this dominant framework that organizes our work, our thoughts, our actions, then we fall prey to what I call problemism, which I describe somewhat sarcastically as a socially contagious mindset that thrives in computing. It creates a kind of cognitive bias that causes those affected to interpret complex situations as sets of problems so that problem solving becomes the primary organizing concept of work. Um, and of course, this is a, is a slightly exaggerated uh, way to put it. But by making situations appear as if they were just collections of problems, problemism guides us to treat complex situations where many different perspectives and people are involved as if there were something we can solve like a, like a chess puzzle. And so we forget that problems are frames that we construct to make sense of what you do. And so as other perspectives fade out of focus, we engage with these situations in very limiting ways. And so the myths, evacuate history and politics from design and they create what what is left is this series of rational decisions and that creates this illusion of neutral technical rationality like a cockpit from which we can steer technology to a better future one problem at a time but and it appears very coherent but it hides the collateral damage and the suffering it produces so it's it's not hard to see how inadequate that mindset is to deal with the ethical challenges of just sustainability, where effects are uncertain and dispersed and a bit ambiguous, and they happen at a distance to other people at the, who are maybe far away. And so it's incredibly easy to consider these harms to be out of scope. And so in the practice of technology work, that's how the depths of computing get externalized and forgotten. And so in a sense, problemism is kind of the intellectual engine of insolvent computing, you could say. And I'm, I'm aware, of course, I'm putting it in a very uh, bit of provocative way. So here's, but here's an, il an illustration of um, how the myths propel and boost the hype around so-called AI. And so last year at one of the most progressive computing research communities, actually, a, a paper, a peer reviewed paper asked if ChatGPT could radically reimagine a more sustainable world. So the question illustrates something quite important. Um, as an aside, is also the question if we should treat reimagining our world as a problem that we should solve with technology. So I'm discussing this here not to dunk on the author of the paper, of course, it's, it's more the reverse, to illustrate in the spirit of critical friendship how metaphors and myths can pervade even uh, the most progressive corners of computing and how they can mislead us. So can ChatGPT reimagine our world? Of course not, it's a language model. So it cannot, um, if we look at the dictionary definitions, it cannot interpret something in a new or different ways that shows creativity or inventiveness or have a new idea about some, the way something should be as in the Cambridge dictionary. A language model doesn't even imagine without the re, imagining would be to form a mental image or concept of. So instead, as you know, 
It's a tool that generates plausible looking strings of words that are statistically likely to follow after the prompt based on statistics and training data that were obtained without consent and in many cases uh, likely illegally from millions, including from millions of hours of unauthorized YouTube transcripts. So ChatGPT is a statistical model that makes things up, but it doesn't lie. Algorithms do not think, they don't hallucinate, they don't imagine, because those are not the actions of algorithms, but the actions of living beings with intentions and imagination. And so in the paper in question, though, there's something interesting going on um, that I just want to point out um, and, and use to talk about what that really is, metaphor. Um, there's a sentence there that says that the tool is born and trained in our current world. And so it's important to be aware. Um, and so think of the phrase born and raised in Italy. It's quite amazing. Here's the definition of what that actually means. And maybe you want to sit with that image for a moment. Tools are, of course, not born. They don't emerge from the body of their mother to begin life as a physically separate being. Tools are produced. So that's, of course, that's a metaphor. A metaphor happens every time we use concepts from one domain we're familiar with to explain another domain we're less familiar with. Metaphors are conceptual domain mapping, and it's central to our thinking. We do it all the time. We take a class or we wonder what to take away from this talk. But once you notice them, metaphors are ubiquitous and fascinating and normal. But when we use them, we have to be careful. And when we use human concepts like imagining to describe the so-called AI, that is a misleading metaphor that distorts what we, we can actually talk about. And unfortunately, it's currently all over the media and academic research. And so without paying much attention, we begin to attribute aspects of life, like creativity, to something that is more like a giant spreadsheet. So that is imaginative, but it's, it's very misleading. So all this, of course, is very convenient for the AI industry and its salespeople, and it has always been very convenient since the 1960s, when uh, Herbert Simon and many others claimed that intelligence is the work of symbol systems, and that both the computer and the human mind and the brain, for him there was no difference, um, were really two instances of the same type, which was information processor. So this false claim that the human mind was equivalent to a computer set the foundation for decades of empirical work. It's still the foundation. And so why is that a really bad idea? I think there are, there are two obvious big reasons. First, it leads to a very poor understanding of ourselves as flawed computers. If our base model for understanding thought is the computer, then all these human strengths like empathy or situational awareness or reflective judgment, they appear basically irrational. But any deviation from perfect calculation is a defect, and it's very easy to spot the defect. So that makes for a lot of scientific papers to be written, uh, but decision-making research is kind of still dealing with the consequences of this very poor theory of thought. And then second, it also leads to a very poor understanding of computers as human-like agents, and that underpins a lot of the hype and confusion about the abilities of computers and so-called AI and how they compare to ours. That is very convenient, again, for the AI industry because it feeds the hype. Um, the truth is there is no AI. That was always branding right from the start. And so it is, is only if we accept this underlying premise of the metaphor, computer is a mind, is a computer, then we can be fooled into asking a question like, can ChatGPT imagine a new world for us? Or as some media articles ask, what kind of mind does ChatGPT have? None, of course, it doesn't have a mind. Um, it does not hallucinate, uh, but some, some who write about it do. So the false equivalence is a really bad deal for us humans. It makes our thought appear really impoverished and irrational, and it endows computers with imaginative abilities they cannot possibly have. And so, of course, that computing and the mind are two different things is not new. It's been clear for, for decades. Uh, just that the fact that our mind can calculate or compute does not mean that it is a computer. No more than the fact that our phones can show maps make, means that our phones are maps. We're also capable of reflection and mindfulness and altruism and wisdom and love. 
our mind is embodied, our cognition is inactive, we're a lot more. And so once you recognize um, cognition and intelligence and decision making through such perspectives, it's kind of ludicrous to expect that imagination should emerge from an algorithm. And it is, but it is common because these metaphors are pervasive and persuasive and this appeal of equivalence has been very enduring. And so this is one way in which the, the, the myths and metaphors shape how we, how we talk about things. And um, this is why in a sense, computing is stuck. And so computing has managed to externalize its ethical depths. And one task that many of us have been working on is to make that visible. And then insolvency arises from that. It's the inability to meet one's obligation. And so in practice, in finance, insolvents can be met in one or two ways, one of two ways. Um, it's either bankruptcy or restructuring. And I'm suggesting not bankruptcy, but to restructure, to reorganize and reorient computing in the tech world. And to do that, we need to deconstruct these myths and we need to replace them with stories that are more accurate and more nuanced. And so if we want to work in that space and do that reorientation and work for sustainability and justice, we need to consider that computing can help very well in addressing domain complexity and help with social coordination, but it is not itself equipped to handle ethical complexity. And so because these myths prevent meaningful change, we do, we do need to face them and we need to work around them. And so the good news is we can do that we can work it out <laughs> in conjunction with other fields. Uh, computing and IT can figure out how to get out from that undertow and learn to play in a genuinely helpful role. And that can be a quite important role. And uh, IT already contains many pockets of critical and divergent perspectives that work like that, that are hard at work at overcoming this impasse. It's just that the computing mainstream might not be there yet, but more and more people in the tech world are waking up in a sense and realizing that what we have now is not good enough. We need a different computing. And so those who can help best, um, the, the best critical friends often come from critical and feminist perspectives, in my view, in fields like sociology, the humanities, philosophy. And I call these researchers and fields the critical friends of computing. And so I mentioned this before, basically, a critical friend brings support and respect to the table, but they bring enough distance to challenge us. You could say that the critical friends are the friends who tell us what no one else dares to tell us, uh, and we wouldn't listen to others, maybe. They critique because they care, and so do I. And that can make us quite uncomfortable, but uncomfortable is good. It's often the starting point for change. And so, of course, some communities in computing and in tech have long cultivated constructive relationships with their critical friends. Um, for example, much of the work on critical design methods in human computer interaction draws from intersectional feminist theory and from science and technology studies. So we, we don't have the time here to talk about through the, all that deep history and details, but, um, I want to highlight just how important it is to take um, what is what might be called a critical approach, um, just because that is also not so commonly done in computing. So the thing is that critical theory helps us demonstrate how existing arrangements can look more inevitable than they are. And so once we see that things that appear necessary could actually be different, that opens up a path for change. And so Andrew Finberg summarized that very well. His Critical philosophy of technology builds on critical theory to demonstrate how existing technological arrangements can look more inevitable than they are. And in, in his words, the illusion of pure rationality obscures the imagination by granting existing technology and rationalized socialized social arrangements an appearance of necessity they cannot actually legitimately claim. Critical theory demystifies that appearance to open up the future and it situates rationality within the political where the consequences become a challenge to responsibility. And so the point is not to give up on technical approaches, not at all, but to place technical approaches within a critical social framework and remember that we do have imagination, something that AI profoundly lacks. So we can create things differently. And so I was fortunate to develop some of these critical relationships with a few fields. 
And each of them has insights to offer that help us overcome some of these myths. And, and some of them are very particularly um, addressing some of the myths. Um, and so, for example, critical systems thinking helps us reflect on the assumptions and boundaries of our models um, and of our approaches and methods. So we can embed those methods within an appropriate ethical frame. So you could say that it allows us to locate the technical within a legitimate scope so that it can work effectively and ethically. Um, on the other hand, uh, feminist science and technology studies, for example, has helped a community I'm part of um, to perform a deconstructive exercise that helped us um, recognize our social location and, and it helped us recognize some hidden assumptions and values of our field and our community and to analyze our own circumstance as members of the community who were working for change. Um, and it has a lot more to offer. And then judgment and decision making in the, in the naturalistic tradition has helped me recognize some um, very, very odd um, peculiarities and, and misunderstandings in how we humans really make choices and to correct some of misinterpretations of behavioral research, um, especially on something called intertemporal choice in systems design. And those are really fundamental to sustainability. And so I thought I might illustrate that briefly. Just enough time, I think. So, so here's the flip side of the myth of the human mind as a computer. If we don't oppose that, we, we will end up thinking of ourselves in, in very impoverished ways. And this has a lot of influence on how we think about decisions that we take in just sustainability. So this is a little complex to explain uh, because that myth has, has influenced and distorted about six decades of research in behavioral economics and in cognitive psychology, and then in software engineering and management and some fields in computing. Um, but I'll, I'll try briefly, and uh, let's use a, this cartoon for that. And so sustainability is the capacity to endure. So it's always a question about choices between outcomes that are further away in the future. And psychologists or behavioral economists um, call that intertemporal choice, choices between close and distant outcomes. And so um, one example I, I do enjoy is this is the one that Calvin faces in this cartoon. And so Christmas is approaching. He's a greedy boy. He wants to get gifts, but he knows that he has to behave or else he thinks he won't get gifts. And he loves annoying his neighbor, Susie. And so he wants to throw a snowball, a slush ball. And so he complains that his immediate pleasure is pitted against his future greed. And his tiger named Hobbes, like the philosopher Hobbes, uh, he thinks that it's hopeless. And Calvin very strongly objects, it's not hopeless. And so the myth comes into play when we study how Calvin makes his choice. In the rationalist tradition uh, of decision-making research based on this metaphor of the mind like a computer, Calvin is exhibiting a phenomenon that is called temporal discounting. So his choice preference, if he throws the ball, suggests that a very, very small pleasure now is more important to him than a much larger pleasure of Christmas gifts. And so in his conventional view of decision-making, he computes the benefit of hitting Susie and the benefit of the Christmas gifts, and then he compares them to pick the larger one. And because Christmas is not for another week, it's far away, he's a young kid, supposedly he's going to apply a discount factor. And that factor is, is applied to reduce his perception of the value of the gift in comparison to the value of short-term gratification. And so he exhibits temporal discounting. In a way, his computing is flawed because he has a short-term bias. And so in this logic, we can calculate how much Calvin is discounting or devaluing the future. And we're going to quantify how much he deviates from some sort of supposedly perfect calculation, rational choice as the bias. And that's been the central story of behavioral economics. It's, it's quite depressing as a story. Um, it suggests that benefits are always something we can measure and compute. That Calvin's brain is just not capable to properly compute the comparison function because he's human. And all humans are brutes, as Thomas Hobbes suggested. So this is very fitting that this is the tiger's name. And so because of these effects, it's a lost cause. And um, of course, I would agree with Calvin, it's not a foregone conclusion. Um, it's just not so straightforward for us in technology design, of course. It's not just one individual's choice, it's not just the individual's own future. And then all the, the difficulties with just sustainability is dispersion and fragmentation come into play. And when we design technology 
designed for others, and it can be hard to pinpoint the choices, but we can try. And so the chart here on the left is from one of the studies we've done, uh, my team and I. The details are not really so crucial, but what we did is we asked over 100 participants to make a project management decision. And so on the, on the bottom from left to right, you see the time horizon, one year to 10 years. And on the, on the vertical axis, you see an evaluation value. There is no assumption in this chart on how that happens. It's just a, just a description. Um, and so in that study, we found that many participants do exhibit some sort of short-term preferences, but not all of them. And really all we can say is that some participants behave as if they discounted. And so now the myth is going to structure how we talk about that and how we approach that. Now, if we think of the human mind as a broken computer, then all we see is that there is an average statistical trend pointing up and then the explanation from conventional behavioral economics. So the myth of rational decision-making tells us a story of criteria, options, weightings, ranking, and choice. So the only option that we have in that story is to try and manipulate ourselves into tricking our biases or, or, or just let an algorithm decide. Now, the thing is that in truth, it is possible that Calvin would throw the slush ball, but his mind doesn't actually work like that. No one's mind actually works like that. Our mind is not a computer. Our mind is embodied in active neural nervous interacting with the body, with the environment. Our thinking is social and historical. It en encompasses a lot more than processing data to compute a signal to be sent to Calvin's arm to say, throw that ball. He's not a robot. Human beings are capable of computational thinking and of situational awareness, reflection, insight, learning, foresight, cooperation, wisdom, judgment, lots of things. But this myth of supposedly rational and irrational decision-making has pervaded research and common sense so fully that we often don't even notice it. So if we don't actively evade this false equivalence of the mind with computing, we fall into its traps all the time without even realizing it. And there's, there's many, many studies that fall into these traps uh, without realizing it. And so if we listen to the critical friends, they tell a very different story. And so the details are complex and there's a fascinating history that spans five decades. But essentially, naturalistic researchers point out that this model does not explain reality at all. This is not what happens. It's not how people think. Even those people who are trained in and who believe these methods, and I've done a PhD on these methods, um, the, the human mind can compute, of course, but it's not a computer. It's much more than that. So the conventional explanation, it just overlooks most of the things that are really going on when people are in a situation making a choice. People actually make very nuanced judgments in light of the situation they find themselves in. And so in our earlier study that I just showed, we did look for correlations and predictors, and we, we looked for what might predict long-term choices or short-term choices. And we actually found that the only factor in our participants that statistically predicted their preferences was how broad their previous work experience was. So the more diverse their prior responsibilities in their jobs, the more likely they were to act with a long-term vision and to take the long-term choice. And in a more recent um, cognitive studies where we performed interviews as well, we noticed that there are basically three behavioral patterns. Some participants would do what we call discounting. Some are actually indifferent to time and some exhibit foresight. And many of them were actually very articulate about how they would like to take a long-term view or why they thought the time difference should not matter. So what we really have to figure out is why do some people act with long-term vision even they don't have to? Why do others not do that even though they want to? What can we learn from them and how can we amplify their, their wise judgments, for example? And so moving beyond the myths gives us a whole new perspective and one that is actually very full of, of hope and interesting things. Um, and it's only by confronting the myth that we can actually get out of that torque of that story of, of criteria and choice. Um, so to summarize, um, the myth of rational decision-making treats humans as defect computers. Recognizing that people are much more than rational allows designers, for example, to notice how their judgments transcend that very narrow frame and it allows research 
researchers and educators to account for much more varied forms of human judgment in design. And the truth is that Hobbes was very wrong about humans and the human nature in crisis. When humans face crisis, the most natural and immediate reaction is often not theft or destruction, but mutual aid. And when humans are left to govern public goods in a way that resembles the commons, the outcome is not at all an inevitable destruction of all resources. We're capable of remarkable feats of long-term cooperation. It's just that we've maneuvered ourselves into a world in which we rarely face the conditions that make that the easy path to take. And so um, I guess that's me on the, on the lower right now. It's not a foregone conclusion. So the critical friends teach us that technology is never value neutral. So we need to consider how values shape it and whose values get expressed in it. They teach us that the human mind is capable of reflection and judgment and empathy and foresight and much more. So we need to consider how to amplify our abilities to think long-term and collectively and cooperatively. They remind us that problems are socially constructed frames that we use to make sense of situations to figure out what we can do. So we need to pay attention to the politics and the ethics of defining problems. And they remind us that design is much more than problem solving. And so just sustainability design privileges just sustainability is, and so it has to pay attention to the asymmetric and uneven effects of systems design choices at a distance. It has to be simultaneously constructive. We still need to build tech and critical in the spirit of critical friendship. It situates itself as both technical, social, and ecological at the same time. And it is a call for innovation in computing, where innovation doesn't mean that we're constantly doing more of the same but that we develop new ways of doing things in ecological ways and in just ways. And so I think the really interesting work begins here um, and a lot of it is already taking place. So we're already, we already have many of the correctives to our misery. We know that sustainability and justice are always political and technical, social and ecological. Um, and we know that things need to change profoundly and we know where to begin. And so computing in principle has significant potential for enabling transformative change, but not in the current thought paradigm, I would say. And so just sustainability design is one framework for change that I hope can be helpful with that. And uh, insolvent is a story of how computing got stuck and how the critical friends can help it become unstuck. And engaging with critical friends can be quite uncomfortable and it's not always easy. There are often no easy solutions. But if we're willing to do that, we will find new perspectives on how to work with tech and how to make tech work, not just for billionaires, but for everyone. And I think we can start anywhere. So thank you for listening. And I'm very curious, what do you think? Thank you, Christoph, for, uh, for your presentation. Very interesting. Before uh, leaving space to questions uh, from the room, let me just very shortly comment in that it was quite impressive reading uh, in the introduction of your book uh, uh, the figures about uh, uh, the environmental impact of the, of the blockchain, that you mm -hmm. use the blockchain among, uh, uh, for, for introducing uh, your book. But now, just after one year, that figures really changed a lot in an exponential way with generative AI. It was really quite impressive to listen other figures this evening uh, that are very, very uh, different. It's impressive how they, they scaled up. Very, uh, it was just a, a comment. Uh, in the I've, I've used um, Bitcoin um, quite a few times in, in slides over the years. And every time um, I have used it, I, I ha had a quick look at uh, the latest Dig Economist measure and it always had, it always went up by massive amounts. Uh, so it's, I don't know, I didn't check the latest uh, version, but it's, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions from, from the room, comments? Yes, also, uh, of course, also online, you can intervene, either uh, writing uh, in the chat or just asking uh, to, to speak uh, and having your microphone and we'll give, uh, you, you can ask directly. Uh, 
I might ask a question, just a very simple and quick question. You you were referring to critical friends, and uh, that was a bit of the, the red line of your presentation, and you concluded you gave examples of critical friends. My question is simply, is simply this. Would you consider law as one of the critical friends of uh, computing technology? That is a really, really good question. And I guess it depends on who in law. It very much would depend on who in law. Um, actually, one of the really interesting um, contributions to that same uh, computing community, computing within limits, was this was a really interesting paper by some colleagues um, uh, who asked whether computing could be considered ecocide, uh, and how we could, if we if we le if we map out the the impact of technological and environmental destruction on the on ecological spaces whether it would be legally possible to qualify uh, computing work and data for example a 100 billion dollar data center as ecocide and so the, the i'm i'm i would be extremely interested in uh, in hearing more from from legal scholars on how to make such a case and what kind of case that would be um but i think law just like computing law is uh is a very diverse field, um, and as far as I understand, also internationally very diverse. And so it, I think it probably depends. So I don't think that corporate fossil fuel law is a critical friend of computing, <laughs> but um, climate law, climate justice advocacy law, um, and uh, for example, the the team um, behind the the European Human Rights Court um, decision that was just uh, announced uh, on the the on Switzerland. That sounds like critical friends, but so the the basic um, premise of what I think makes some some field or 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 team uh, critical friends is this found the this basic respect and mutual um, mutual interest and curiosity coupled with a, a distance that allows a friend to f identify things that are uncomfortable to hear but insightful, right? So if so in a sense, so initially critical friend um, comes, the idea comes out of pedagogy, where the idea is that there is a, a partner, and this is a very interpersonal relationship between two people, where one partner is kind of a buddy who watches and um, and who who reflects on, on someone's experience in a way that the person themselves cannot do. And so, yeah, so do you think of law as a possible critical friend? Can well, we be? I mean... <laughs> That's, that, you, you, you gave very good examples of uh, uh, how law can be a critical friend. It, one, one issue that emerges regularly in our meetings at, at Nexa, Nexa is a center that is born essentially as a, as a, as a joint venture between lawyers and, uh, and uh, uh, computer, uh, computer scientists. So this is something that emerges regularly in, in our conversations is the fact that it, it seems that law has lost uh, the, the 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 power to to regulate technology and that uh, um, technology is the more and more uh, uh, ruled by uh, de facto powers uh, the examples you were giving of data centers and uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, it seems that uh, there is this, a sense at least that law has lost uh, the, the, the capacity to do what has been doing for uh, 2,000 years, so to, 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 to regulate the, the common life of, uh, uh, of a society. And, uh, um, and there, are, there are various, uh, I mean, there are various aspects that could, could, be, could be highlighted in, the, in these respects, but uh, uh, law is, 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 is now seen more in terms of, uh, of uh, um, regulation, something that Europeans are, are, are very good at. And uh, the, the question is how, how far this uh, regulating effort can, uh, uh, can act as, as a critical friend, as, as, you, as you rightly, rightly pointed, not, not just to limit technology, but to, to, to orient technology in a in a in a meaningful way. So that I'm I'm, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, uh, um, um, remembering uh, issues that are discussed uh, frequently in our in, in, in our meetings. So. Mm -hmm.
Ludovica? If I may, just because as a lawyer, I wasn't intrigued by your point of view, uh, just to have something that you said about the role of the law, uh, you undermined the, 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 re the relevance of, uh, of justice and injustice in the development of technology. So there are scholars, uh, I'm thinking, first of all, to Katina Pistor, for example, that says that law has a very, I mean, uh, it's very relevant in the identification between justice and injustice developments of technology. So uh, maybe these can be one of the profiles that can be underlined. And also you mentioned the, uh, the ambiguity as a as a, not a characteristic, but the challenges uh, of just sustainability. And law has to, to, to deal with the ambiguity and flexibility of time. So I can see some elements. I don't know if law can be identified as a critical threat, but for sure I can I can see the space of uh, a leeway. We don't know, just with the comment. Can I ask I something? Maybe this understanding that um, human decisions are always also judgments is something that is is much more obvious in law where judgment is of course uh, maybe the central thing about it in a sense at least from a lay person's perspective um but it's also that uh yeah i mean maybe from the side of technology one could say don't give up on regulation um uh, because we need that very badly and uh and in a sense law is still the the established framework of keeping tech accountable and uh, in a sense needs to double down on that and many of the most promising leverage points for for reorienting computing not just in the way we think but in the in the way it acts out at scale based um based on capitalist interests that is legal frameworks for regulation and international frameworks for accountability and that those are all have to be legal frameworks so uh so that, that's something where the the tech world needs the legal action very badly let's put it like that to reorient practice yeah thank you but firstly i would like to thank you it was very inspiring and um, i'm a researcher in in situated in one of the critical fields that you mentioned i i am a mathematician that works in the intersection between feminism, technology, and arts. And I wanted to add something related to what Ludovica just said. Uh, Ludovica spoke about ambiguity, but I remember you mentioned uncertainty in your, um, in your presentation. And uncertainty, in a way, is also a very powerful tool, a very powerful epistemic tool to relate femi intersectional feminism uh, technology and uh, I guess computer science. Uh, this is like so. Here is uh, where my where my question goes. I mean, how can we deal with uncertainty in computer scientists in computer science? And is uncertainty? And of course, when I think about uncertainty being a human in a very wide way. I think about uh, the legacy of every ontological perspective that we have. So we, as in, a, in the Western framework, we are really used to think about the, the matter of, of things, not that things are, while um, uncertainty can, can be, I go back to this idea of an epistemic power to leave some space uh, to other aspects and okay this is like my my question i mean the question is i know, I know it's really big but it's about uncertainty and it's and, it, and it's related to what ludovica just said and you just gave a mention in the talk so i was really interested about it if you can give any thought about it thanks hmm. thank you yeah this uh, this is a big topic of course um so i mean the one thing that stands out and maybe to cl clarify so uh, i i do draw on a, a, what i find a very useful distinction in a very in a very simple way on the distinction between uncertainty as an uncertain a probabilistic model of uncertainty 
and ambiguity as an uncertainty about the uncertainty that also comes with difference in meaning. So ambiguity is the is sort of the more human experience and uncertainty is the more risk modeling experience. To put it too simply, that is of course too simple, but it's one way to differentiate. Um, and then, <clears throat> um, and so then the thing is that the, the ambiguity in the meat, the, the flexibility of interpretation, the openness of what really will happen is something that computing finds very really difficult to handling. And of course, we have all sorts of excellent probabilistic models, we have uncertainty models, we have predictions and forecasts and fuzzy theory. Um, and so all of that exists, but it, it, it does not really capture ambiguity uh, because ambiguity is such a fundamentally interpretive concept. And so I think what, what happens there is that at some point, computing encounters the boundary of what it cannot really model and the traditional response is this imperial idea that we just need more models and then we can model some more. And to some degree, of course, that's true. You can de develop ever more complicated, complex models. And we've been really good at doing a lot of that. But there is always a boundary of what is left just outside. And we cannot just keep doing that on infinitum. We, there is always a boundary, right? And so one question is then how do we recognize what that boundary is, how do we reflect on that, how do we become aware of that, and how do we account for that in the technological work that we still will do. And um, that is where kind of feminist theory comes in um, and, and requests that accountability to location and situation. And one framework I found extremely useful to do that is not feminist in, in, a, in explicit orientation, but has a lot of um, alignment with the feminist call for situatedness, which is critical systems heuristics, uh, which Antonio is a bit familiar with, or quite familiar with, um, which really allows us to interrogate systematically where knowledge is, where the models are based on, in which location socially, and to become more aware of those boundaries, and then make an ethical choice whether those boundaries are acceptable and legitimate or not. And so it's at that point, when you say let's have a you have a, a risk model of flooding, then and you know you can look at the nature of uncertainty that is captured, and you could um, reflect on that with the more feminist attention to ambiguity and enter into a dialogue that allows you to make an ethical judgment on whether your capturing of uncertainty and ambiguity is legitimate for um, in terms of how it will affect those who get affected by your your choices. Maybe that makes some sense. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Uh, I have a couple of, uh, of, of questions. Um, the first one is about uh, uh, the critique that uh, you did uh, um, in the book on the ICM code of ethics, it was, uh, I mean, the, the, the ICM code of ethics is the reference point for software engineers that uh, um, are willing to make a change in the discipline. At least we have a reference point that is there, okay? It's a common reference point. Uh, there is a principle there that you, you, you write very well in the book, uh, the principle to avoid harm that is quite uh, uh, it's quite challenging, okay? Uh, and maybe you can you can explain better than me why. So uh, my question is: Are you aware of uh, uh, initiatives to to um, to improve the ASM code ethics in terms of proportionality of of the of the um, I mean of the arms uh, participation of the affected it is totally absent at the moment. So the, the first question is is about that, and the second question is is about uh, um, initiatives that you are aware of um, in which uh, the critical friends were successfully injected into. Uh, in the, to the curricula of computer science, like uh, ethics. So now we have a lot of uh, computer science uh, curricula in which ethics is present. Are you aware of, uh, of a similar success uh, for uh, uh, 
uh, our critical friends uh, or or not? <laughs> that, that, excellent. Yeah, we we should uh, we we can talk about that for hours. Um, so, <clears throat> well, so first maybe on the on the ethics uh, on the ethics codes. Um, I'm not aware of any such initiative, and I would not expect an institution like that to um, to embark on such an initiative now. Uh, there is a there is a very large and bureaucratic process around releasing a new one. Um, it was done with a what was it? it was sixteen no twenty six years from one to the next, and I do not expect that to be ha taking place anytime soon. Um, I'm also not very interested in that. To be perfectly honest, um, I think. What this really, what this whole episode of the ACM Code of Ethics really brought home to me is how how little that does, without without full legal accountability, especially, but also with this the, w the with the way in which the entire conversation is sort of hijacked by corporate interests and the the way it, it was really quite fascinating. So this is this is detailed in chapter 12 of Insolvent, um, my experience with the ACM Code of Ethics and how the there was a draft of um, the the principally avoid harm that was essentially about not avoiding harm at all. And um, that not only removed some of the um, some of the foundational uh, Principles such as the proportionality principle in ethics, but also le leaves it completely up to the uh, authority of whoever is doing the tech work to decide whether something is legitimate or not. And so it, it falls short of any ethics standards of proportionality and accountability at all. And um, and as I brought this up, the the institution found it more important to maintain the appearance of legitimacy than to engage in such a debate. There was no critical friendship there at all. There was just, um, there was uh, essentially false pretenses online, um, followed by, followed by a silent change. And, um, and so the, the worst part of it was averted in a sense. Um, it would take a little longer to go through this in detail, I think, but, the, essentially, there is, and, and many many have written about the, the capture of ethics and the, the way in which large companies shop around for whatever ethics codes best describe what they already do to then have uh, the legitimacy of ethical AI, for example. And um, essentially, there is very there is very little weight or meaning to any of these things without legal accountability in which and without uh, clear transparency. So, <clears throat> I would I would care very little about that. Um, in the class I teach on just sustainability design, we do talk a bit about ethics with a, a really brilliant piece that I can highly recommend, um, which is called a mulching proposal by Os Keys and others, um, and um, which just kind of brings home how these um, purely legalistic ethical frameworks of, um, of fairness, accountability, and transparency in this case uh, mean very little if we do not consider you know, what is what are the values, what are the harms that are actually um, conducted by the tech field, build. And so instead, I'm more interested, and we, in, in this class as well, we talk much more about values than we talk about ethics, because I find it much harder to avoid the, this, the, the, the ethical conversation um, if the conversation is very frankly and, and, and very directly about values, because then there is immediately the question, which values do we want to prevail? And you recognize that there are contradictions and conflicts between different values. And so the conversation inevitably turns to power and who has power. And that is much more, much more fruitful, much more generative than a formalistic conversation about ethical principles and whether you can get away with something or not. And, and so in that sense, um, I think that is, that is really crucial that any, um, any ethics initiative in education pays very close attention to the relationship between ethics and norms and values and to highlight the importance of reflection and sensitivity to values and power rather than the formalistic idea of ethics and essentially ethics principles in computing convert those value or like act to convert the values choices into a, a an algorithm that you can use to decide whether you're allowed to do something or not so they they create this prescriptive set of rules that works like an algorithm and so that, it, it, together with the other myths, then works perfectly to say, well, if you did the job right, 
And if you follow generally accepted best practices, then you know, you're good to go. Whatever, whatever else happens is not your problem. And that's exactly how debts get externalized. <clears throat> and if on the other hand, you speak about questions like which values and whose values get priority and what kind of facts do they become? You can't really, you can't really hide from that conversation so easily. Um, and so, yeah, so in that sense, there, there have been some really good um, initiatives um, everywhere, I think, in, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of HCI departments. There are really wonderful courses being taught that bring all these things together in design justice, in data feminism, in participatory design. Um, one thing I, I've, I thought was really wonderful was a way in which the, the Vienna University of Technology um, opened um, a, an, uh, an introductory course um, and Chris Fraunberger and others have written about this ways of thinking in informatics, which I think was a really beautiful way to broaden from computational thinking and to clarify that in truth, computational thinking is only one of the many ways that happen. And uh, so that already kind of decenters the primacy of purely algorithmic prescriptive thought and brings it in dialogue with others, which is kind of the basis on which you can then form all these critical friendships. Um, and then, of course, there's many embedded ethics in a, uh, frameworks and programs in, in different universities. And I think one really crucial argument there that is, is important is that you cannot have ethics as, you know, a separate course, a separate module, um, an appendix at the end that, you know, the final course, oh, there also there has to be some ethics. That can't be like that. Instead, you really need to make the conversation about ethics and values a part of every single course. And that's difficult, of course, especially if you have a lot of people who already teach courses on the basis of these myths who don't want to change their courses. So that's really difficult then. And you need some kind of bureaucratic policy framework to roll that out so that this becomes part of the evaluation of, of courses and so on. And I know that European universities do this very differently from North American universities. So you might not have much of a leverage point there. Um, but, uh, but to bring these conversations into all the classes, into introductory programming, into, uh, you know, computer architectures and their, their, their energy impact, uh, you know, you have to bring this into everything. And, and that's definitely difficult, but it is being done. And I think the embedded ethics initiatives are some of the interesting places to look for, for example. I would love to hear what you're doing. That. Uh, I, I think we can we can share the initiatives of the uh, if if Juan Carlos agrees of the global challenges and courses uh, that we do at Politico. Uh, I may may I ask you? Oh, I okay. I uh, so here uh, we have uh, uh, since a couple of years uh, we have a set of. Uh, uh, 24 classes uh, that are in parallel. One of them can be chosen, and they are they are taught uh, by an engineer and by a, a professor from the from the the human and social sciences, and uh, on on selected challenges for humanity. There is one uh, on, uh, of course, the climate crisis. One on the uh, digital revolution. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the other the other four. Transportation, energy, health, uh, climate. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, and uh, uh, the idea is to expose all, not only computer engineers, but uh, all engineers to. Um, to thinking and not uh, in a within silos, silos, uh, the, the disciplinary silos, but to be exposed uh, to the different uh, point of view, disciplinary point of views on the same uh, on the same problem. It can be climate change, it can be health, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. So this is something that uh, I think it's valuable to to share since you asked. Uh, that is quite different from, uh, uh, from uh, as you say, the, the norm of putting an ethics course uh, at the end of the, of the curriculum or, some, or something similar. And it was so far quite successful, I would say. 
That sounds very interesting. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great that's a great idea. I would imagine, and and within such a such a um, meeting of the perspectives, there could be a lot of beautiful potential for critical friendships across those perspectives, right? And uh, and a good dialogue. I think one one uh, danger of this might be, or like if you do this within the insolvent computing frame, um, then the danger would be that uh, computing is simply seen as whatever is the technology to solve whatever problems the other people have, right? And that would be, of course, way too narrow. And that's kind of unfortunately how a lot of it is happening. But if you position this as um, a, a clear partnership where the perspectives of both will mutually enrich each other, then of course, then you can have an excellent dialogue. It sounds like a really good model. I'll keep that in mind, actually. Co-teaching can be difficult in bureaucratic ways, but it can also be really wonderful. Right? Have it, are any of you teaching them one of those? Uh, our uh, co-director, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, of uh, techniques and politics. Hmm. Oh, that is now okay. That's fascinating. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I'm also asking for those who are connected from remote. Just leaving some time to think. Yes, please. Sure. Um, I want to say hello from another critical friend, which is decolonial studies, or more importantly, uh, yeah, postcolonial studies, decolonial advocacy, which wants modern computing to confront how it's intertwined with the social and economic legacies of colonialism and how it reinforces hierarchies of race, culture, language, gender. Etc. Just becoming worse with AI and this algorithmic coloniality. Um, and that critical friend says our quest, our quest for just sustainability. The word just means historical justice, even reparations. It's it's conceptually backward oriented. Um, in, in in how how it looks, I mean, it, 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 it it's starting point for its focus. Then sustainability. It's all about our children, our children's children, our children's children, children, uh, or as economists we say, intergenerational equity. Um, and it's sometimes hard to kind of conceptually find the parallels between these two friends. I mean, they say the same things, but uh, balancing these backward-looking and forward-looking perspectives is sometimes really challenging. I mean. There are people in the decolonial space which would say, yes, climate change is a existential crisis for the entire human race, but rich developing countries, you solve this. This is not on us as small developing islands, for example. Um, and the point is, it's just kind of conceptually difficult to find the parallels of what all the critical friends are saying and incorporate that into computing design because the balance is different for each society. So there's no universal ethic, there's no universal set of principles to form um, you know, a, a framework for modern computing. Um, and that universalist approach is part of you know, neoliberal coloniality, so we don't want that. But at the same time, the nature of modern computing is you don't want fragmented things all over the place. We will, we're dealing with networks and scalable things. So I know I'm saying very abstract conceptual things, but like, how do we confront this conceptual challenge of finding the unified voice in all these critical friends and incorporating them into computer design? knowing that we have to be sensitive that these balances are different for each society, different colonial experiences and different risks of climate change. A risk to Italy is different from a, a, a risk to a small Pacific island. Um, so how, how do we confront that act of balancing and fragmentation? Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, also, am I muted? No.
No. Um, thanks so much for bringing up this really, really crucial um, topic and and question. And it's it's one that I'm I'm kind of currently really wanting to dive in. And I'm I, my next book is Hospicing Modernity, uh, which you may be familiar with, and I, I cannot wait to dive into that. Uh, I I do. I'm I'm not completely sure whether just sustainability is necessarily backward oriented, but um, maybe that's maybe that's not the crucial point um, of of what you're saying. Um, but I think this the tension between um, the computing's desire to be universal and abstract, um, which is really a modernist project, a colonial project, and this the the, the decolonial drive is is foundational, and it's maybe not about resolving that into a perfect solution that allows us to develop the next generation of computing um, gear. Um, it's more of a continuous dialogue. And I, I see, um, I, I do find this, um, I don't think we need a universal uh, solution to any of that. I do think we can do a lot of uh, pluriversal uh, ver ways of design and pluriversal ways of, of technology. It, there is maybe a bit of a, a, a natural shift when we say that we overcome, and maybe now we're kind of shifting more into the discussion of capitalism um, because of colonialism, uh, that it's not necessarily about the maximum scale network that connects everything equally into one unified uh, system, and more about uh, collab collaborating, cooperating networks that operate on a scale out rather than scale up basis. And so, you don't necessarily need to unify everything. Um, and so I think this kind of basic idea of a, to design a world where, where many worlds fit, um, the pluriversal idea um, is, is really essential. And you will have noticed how I haven't mentioned sustainable development or the sustainable development goals, um, not because they're, they're, they don't contain some very useful social goals, but because as a framework, I don't consider it legitimate um, because of colonial reasons. And, and it's been said very well by Escobar that uh, it seems that the purpose of sustainable development was to sustain economic development for the global north rather than to sustain the planet. It's not about sustainability, it's about development. And uh, so it's not exactly sustainable um, if it, is, if it con continues to be colonial capitalism that drives it. And so the question then is, what is the role of technology in helping to position itself for a post-colonial, decolonial world? I'm very interested in, in the role of technology in degrowth as a framework that, re or that proposes to reorganize our, our economies so that they're no longer dependent on accumulative expansion that we, we call growth, even though there's very, very little that is actually growing there. It is mostly destruction and accumulation. And so the, the question is, what's the role of technology in that transformation to um, societies that, that redistribute and um, that uh, and identify ways of flourishing for human and non-human nature that are not no longer bound in that um, system of exploitation. And I do think that um, there is a lot more to be said there that I didn't get to quite in insolvent around the critical friendships between decolonizing thought and computing. And that's maybe the next chapter. Um, I'm doing a lot of reading this year on that. So um, I would be very happy if you have any reading suggestions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'd love to chat. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's see if uh, other questions or comments will, uh, will be made. Seems uh, that uh, there are no other questions and and, uh, and comments. So uh, I I would like uh, to thank you again uh, for uh, being here with us uh, this uh, this evening uh, for illustrating uh, your uh, your book and uh, for for giving us uh, sharing with us uh, uh, your uh, your perspective uh, to to improve. The current status uh, of uh, of our discipline uh, of, uh, of of uh, computer science. So uh, thanks again, Christoph. For, for, for. <laughs>